In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asirat Nabawiyya, the prophetic biography. In the last few sessions, we've been discussing Ghazwatul Ahzab, also known as Ghazwatul Khandaq, which translates as the battle of the trench or the battle against the allied armies. And again, I'm not going to rehash all the details, uh, but just as a quick uh, reference point, this occurred towards the end of the fifth year of Hijrah, the fifth year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina. And the background of the situation or the event was that Huyay bin Akhtab, who was one of the leaders of Banu Nadir, this was a tribe, a Jewish tribe, that resided outside of Medina that ended up violating the constitution of Medina. They actually attempted to assassinate the Prophet wasallam. And due to the violation of the constitution of Medina, per the terms of the constitution and the treaty, they were exiled from that region. They went and they took up residence at the place of Khaybar, um, where there were other Jewish tribes. And then from there, he basically conspired and he put together the plan and he recruited the Quraysh along with the people of Ghatfan. And they created an allied army of nearly 10,000 strong and launched an assault and offensive against the city of Medina. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after consultation with his companions on how to go about in protecting the city of Medina because the numbers were too overwhelming for them to go outside and face them openly in the battlefield in an effort to preserve as much life as possible, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted the suggestion of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu and dug a trench around the city of Medina. Part of the city of Medina was protected by the mountains and they posted, you know, archers and guards on those spots. And then for the rest of the city of Medina, they dug a wide trench that basically served as an obstruction from the army invading the city of Medina. And as we talked about, they then laid siege to the city of Medina for about 20 days. They camped out outside of the trench for about 20 days. They continuously kept trying to attack during that time. They kept a barrage and an assault of arrows coming from across the trench. A couple of times, a couple of misguided individuals actually tried to go through the trench and come out on the other side and maybe try to break some of the ranks of the Muslims. But they were dealt with um, by the Muslims and they were dispersed and taken care of at that time. And so this situation and these sequence of events continue to unfold. Now, what we're going to talk about today in today's session when talking about this particular incident is we're going to talk about how did this battle eventually come to a close? How did it end? And a couple of things that will help to understand the circumstances. We've talked about this lasted for... 20, more than 20 days. So you can imagine that it was very difficult and very stressful, all right, to have a large enemy, a very overwhelming enemy camped right outside of your gates for over 20 days while you are sitting there waiting, praying and hoping and making every effort possible so that they do not end up crossing over, they don't end up spilling into the city and then wreaking havoc upon all the inhabitants of the city. So it's a very stressful time. Now factor in a second, uh, take into consideration a second factor. The second factor is, is that <clears throat> 
It was very, very cold. This particular incident took place during the winter time. And it was not only just winter time, but it was one of the most bitter winters that was ever experienced by the people in that area. To the point where it was very remarkable. Even the Muslims and non-Muslims alike all noted the fact that this was probably the harshest winter that they had seen in their lifetimes. And the third thing that I want you to take into consideration is that the Muslims were still very much in a stage. The community was in a stage of infancy, was still very, very young. And so they still had a lot of things that they were figuring out. There were a lot of needs that were still to be met of the community. And the community was still under a lot of economic and financial duress. So because of that, they didn't have a lot of you know, finances, they didn't have a lot of resources. And so that created two challenges. Number one, it is already a harsh winter, so they could not afford, they did not have sufficient covering and garments and clothing to shield them from the cold in the winter. So they're all out there shivering and shaking, barely clothed, Right? Some Sahaba were to the point of poverty, where typically a very common dress at that time for the people of that area, and this is how the Prophet some used to frequently dress as well, is that they would have an izar and a rida. What that means is that they would have a lower garment and an upper garment. Think of how men dress in the ihram when they go for hajj or umrah. Very similar to that. They would have a lower garment that they would tie around their waist to cover their body. And then they would have an upper garment that they would kind of wear like a shawl around their shoulders. And that was very, very common. And that was the typical type of dress that most people had. And they were sheets, thin little worn out old sheets. Some sahaba, however, were at the point where they couldn't even afford two sheets. And they had only one sheet to cover themselves. One of the stories that we're going to discuss today, one of the uh, details of the event that we're going to talk about today, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that I just had only one sheet that I could afford and so the way they would wear it is that they would tie it basically a little bit higher because they didn't have something to cover their upper body. So instead of tying it at their waist, they would tie it from their chest so that it was covering a little bit more. But... Because they were tying it higher up to their chest to be a little bit more covered, be a little bit more modest, instead of going down to like, you know, the bottom of their legs, it was basically up till their knees, just a little bit below their knees. Now imagine being out there in the cold, bitter, bitter cold, exposed outside in the elements, right? Harsh desert winter, strong winds are blowing. It is freezing temperatures, wearing one sheet, that covers you basically from your chest to your knees. And then the second factor because of their economic hardship was that they couldn't even afford sufficient uh, food. They couldn't afford sufficient food. And so they didn't have any food. They would go days without eating. There are incidents and narrations which talk about the fact that they would tie stones to their belly to basically suppress their hunger and to try to keep their backs upright. And we read about the miraculous, we talked about the miraculous event where a sahabi per, uh, prepared enough food to feed like four people. The Prophet ﷺ, maybe a couple of guests. And then through a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, he basically was able to feed 800 people with the, just that one little bowl of food. Alright, so the, factor in all these different things as well. Now another element on top of everything else that we talked about previously, and we're going to revisit inshallah in a future session, and that is that within the city of Medina, within the area of Medina, there was another Jewish tribe that was still resident there, the only one of the three remaining in terms of Banu Nadir, Banu Qaynuqa, and the third one was Banu Quraidha. Now Banu Quraidha, they were a part of that constitution of Medina, and they also had a treaty with the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ. And so far, they had, I wouldn't say they had necessarily abided by the terms of the treaty because they didn't come to the defense of the Muslims, they didn't help or aid the Muslims in this situation, but they had not outright violated the treaty either until Huyay bin Akhtab, the one who, had, who was the architect of this entire plan against Medina, he went there, recruited Banu Quraidha, was able to get them to tear up the agreement, to openly proclaim the end of the constitution. They violated the agreement publicly and openly, and they also turned against the Muslims. So now think about the extra stress and tension and worry and concern that that adds to the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. Then now there's an enemy 
within our boundaries, within our area, that could attack us at any moment. And we already talked about how a couple of them actually did try to attack the men and the women who were fortified, who were being kept within uh, one, bound, one compound, that they had gone there to try to see if they could attack the men and the, the women and the children. Excuse me. So all of these things combined together, they were dealing with so much. All of this is going on. And so how did this battle finally conclude? It seems like the Muslims have their back against the walls. And so after all this difficulty and sacrifice, you know, and some people, I'm going to entertain the question here because people have this question. Some might not have this question. But nevertheless, some people do. So I'll go ahead and entertain the question here. And that is the fact that somebody could say that because the way that the battle ended was the Prophet ﷺ made dua for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come and for this situation to be resolved. So somebody could say, why wasn't that dua just made the very first day or the second day or the third day? Why on the 20 something day? Right? Why 20 something days later? Well, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that have people really assumed, do people really assume that they can say, that they will be left to say, we believe, we believe, and then that they won't be tested? Right? لِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَلِيَعْلَمَ الصَّادِقِينَ So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who believes and Allah knows who is truthful. وَلِيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا And then Allah can also know about who is not truthful in their claim of being Muslim. And we saw that, that there were some of the hypocrites, the munafiqun, right? The, the, the secretive, covert enemy that lived amongst the Muslims, that they waited and at the most inopportune times, we talked about this, they would say, إِنَّ بُيُوتَنَا awra." Right? They, they would say to the Prophet ﷺ, Oh, our homes are exposed, we're worried about our homes, we need to go, we need to leave, we can't stay here, we can't fight with you, we can't defend Medina with you. And, the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةٍ يُرِيدُونَ إِلَّا فِرَارًا That their homes are not exposed, they just are cowardly. And they just want to run away and leave you high and dry. So, yes, a lot of difficulty and adversity was endured. And this was part of the divine plan, part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a part of what we call from the Quranic perspective, the sunnah of Allah. وَلَن تَجِيدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا Allah tests people and He tests their resolve. And this is an opportunity for people to shine and for people to be able to prove their worth. Or it's similarly sometimes a very tragic moment where people, they expose themselves and their lack of resolve and their lack of belief. So that's why this event uh, continued for as long as it did. So finally, as the books of history and the books of Sirah mention, Imam Ahmad rahimullahu ta'ala relates on the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, Qulna yawm al-Khandaq. We said, uh, we said to the Prophet sallallahu on the day, uh, while the battle of the trench was going on, Ya Rasulullah, hal min shay'in naquluhu? Is there anything that we can say? And what that means is there a dua that we can make? Is there something that would be appropriate for us to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this moment? فَقَدْ بَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ That we are under such duress and stress and difficulty that it feels like our hearts are going to come out of our throats. Our hearts have gotten stuck in our throats. Like we can't breathe, we can't sleep. It's too much to bear. And the Prophet ﷺ said, نَعَمْ He said, yes. اللَّهُمَّ اسْتُرْ عَوْرَاتِنَا وَآمِنْ رَوْعَاتِنَا That he said, make the dua that our Allah protect our homes and grant our families and us safety and security. Allahumma astur awratina wa amin rawatina. And then he goes on to say, فَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ وُجُوهَا أَعْدَائِهِ بِالْرِيحِ فَهَزَمَهُمْ اللَّهُ بِالْرِيحِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obliterated the enemy with the wind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeated them by means of the wind. In another narration, <coughs> The Imam Ahmad also relates this from Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam masjid al-Ahzab that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came to the place so if you it, it's no longer really visible today but if you visit the city of Medina the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there is a masjid that is constructed that is built at the place where the battle of the trench occurred where the trench was dug there's a big grand masjid that is built there now but if you had the opportunity to visit back 
in the day, and even now you can see some of the remnants of it, that there are different little spots where there were stations of prayer that were established because they had to keep guard over the trench at all times. They couldn't just leave it. So they had different prayer stations, right? They had seven different places where prayer would be established and little prayer stations. And so <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ came to one of those places where they were praying during the battle of the trench for 20 something days. The Prophet ﷺ, the shawl that he was wearing, he put it down on the ground and basically uncovering his shoulders, uncovering his chest as a sign of desperation before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands all the way up above his head. وَلَمْ يُصَلِّي That the Prophet ﷺ was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help against the enemy. And he didn't pray at that time. He just came and he made dua. ثُمَّ جَاءَ Then he came back a little while later. وَدَعَا عَلَيْهِمْ And he again made dua for help against the enemy. وَصَلَّى And then he prayed. And then in Bukhari and Muslim, Abdullah bin Abi Awfa رضي الله تعالى عنه says, دَعَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَمَ عَلَى الْأَحْزَابِ the Prophet ﷺ made dua for help against the enemy, and he narrates the dua the Prophet ﷺ made. He said, Allahumma munzil al kitab, sari al hisab, ihzim al ahzaba, Allahumma hazimhum, Allahumma hazimhum, wa zalzilhum. That in another, another narration, he said, Allah mahzimhum wa nsurna alayhim. That the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, you are the one who reveals the book, the Quran, and you are the one who swiftly deals with matters. Defeat the enemy for us and shake them to their core. In another narration, he said, Oh Allah, defeat them and help us against them. And Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the narration of Bukhari, he says, The Prophet ﷺ used to say, La ilaha illallah wahda, a'azza junda, wa nasara abda, wa ghalab al ahzaba wahda, fala shay abada. That the Prophet ﷺ continued to say, there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah alone. He strengthened his army and he helped his slave, referring to himself. And we learned some of the etiquette of dua, that these are words being spoken from the heart. We see the Prophet ﷺ stretching his arms out before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dua is made from the heart and you communicate, you pour your heart out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you show humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He refers to himself, yes he is the messenger of Allah and the prophet of Allah and the beloved of Allah, but he refers to himself as a slave of Allah. وَنَصَرَ abda, وَغَلَبَ الْأَحْزَابَ وَحْدًا And Allah alone defeated the allied armies. He doesn't doesn't take any credit for it. He says, Oh Allah, you take care of them. Fala shay abada, and there is nothing after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything ends and everything concludes with Allah. And so the Ibn Ishaq and other scholars of the Sirah they narrate exactly one of the major things that played into the conclusion of this battle. And that is that. After talking about وَأَقَامَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَصْحَابُهُ فِي مَا وَصَفَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَشِدَّةِ That if you read Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, which we're going to go through that section of it, inshaAllah, in the next session, that after you read everything that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were going through, in terms of difficulty and uh, being overwhelmed and having the enemy encroaching upon them, لِتَظَاهُرِ عَدُوِّهِمْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَإِتِيَانِهِمْ إِيَّاهُمْ مِن فَوْقِهِمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْهُمْ That they were coming from in front of them and there was an enemy coming from the back of them, which was the Banu Quraida. At that time, a man by the name of Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud, رضي الله تعالى عنه, who was from Ghatfan. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni qad aslamtu. He was from Ghatfan. He was part of the tribe that was, a, that was a member of this allied army against the Muslims and against Medina. He says, I am from Ghatfan. I have become Muslim. But my people do not know that I am Muslim yet. I came with my people, but I am a Muslim, but my people don't know that I'm Muslim. فَمُنِّي بِمَا شِئْتَ So tell me, is there anything I can do in this situation? Is there any way I can assist? So the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ فِينَا رَجُلٌ وَاحِدٌ He said, the Prophet ﷺ said, amongst all of us, you are in a very unique position. You, we have a very unique strategic advantage with you. And he said, فَخَذِّلْ عَنَّا إِنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ فَإِنَّ الْحَرْبَ خَدَعَ 
The Prophet ﷺ said, I need you to convert to 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 conduct some covert activity, some strategic activity on our behalf, because war is deception. War is strategy. Right? War is strategy, so you are very in a very unique position and you can serve a very strategic purpose for us. So what is that? He said, okay. So the Prophet ﷺ said that, try to come up with some strategy. So Nu'aym bin Mas'ud, he came up with a plan. And again, this serves the benefit of, yes, war is strategy, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't suggest any type of thing. He just said, look, try to do what you can, because war is strategy. So he said, all right. He went, on, and he went out and he came up with a plan. He went first, he went to Banu Quraydah, the Jewish tribe. وَكَانَ لَهُمْ نَدِيمًا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ he used to regularly visit the tribe of Banu Quraidah and he had a lot of old friends in Banu Quraidah and the word Nadim that he's described as would specifically use in that context for he had a lot he had a couple of old drinking buddies in Banu Quraidah. Like he used to party with them, drink with them, like wine, alcohol, before Islam, Fil Jahiliya. So he went to go visit a couple of them and you know got some time with a couple of their leaders and he said, Ya Banu Quraida. قَدْ عَرَفْتُمْ وُدِّي إِيَّاكُمْ وَخَاسَةَ مَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ He said, you know, you know, we're old friends, we're old buddies, we have an old relationship. And they said, صَدَقْ absolutely, لَسْتَ عِنْدَنَا بِمُتَّعْمْ We trust you. So he said, إِنَّ قُرَيْشٍ وَغَطْفَانْ لَيْسُوا كَأَنْتُمْ He said, listen, your partners in this whole situation, Quraysh from Makkah and Ghatfan, they're not in the position that you are in. Why? الْبَلَدُ بَلَدُكُمْ you live here. They don't live here. فِيهِ أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَنِسَاؤُكُمْ Your homes are here, your families are here. لَا تَقْدِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَن تَتَحَوَّلُوا مِنْهُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ You can't go anywhere else. وَإِنَّ قُرَيْشًا وَغَطْفَانَ جَاءُوا لِحَرْبِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَأَصْحَابِهِ These people from Quraysh and Ghatfan, they came to fight Muhammad and his companions. وَقَدْ ظَاهَرْتُمُوهُمْ عَلَيْهِ And you also joined up with them against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi But they can go back home. This is your home. They're not in your situation. So he said that, you know, maybe you'll win. Maybe you'll defeat Muhammad and his companions, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But if you're not able to defeat him, Quraysh and Ghatfan are going to go right back home to where they came from. But, and they'll leave you here. They'll abandon you high and dry. Where are you going to go? Then you'll have to deal with Muhammad and his companions by yourself. Right? So what are you going to do? So he said, فَلَا تُقَاتِلُوا مَعَ الْقَوْمِ Don't fight. Don't join forces with these people of Quraysh and Ghatfan against the Muslims. Don't do it. There's only one condition in which you should agree to fight. حَتَّى تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُمْ رُوحَنًا مِنْ أَشْرَافِهِمْ وَيَكُونُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ ثِقَةً لَكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَن تُقَاتِلُوا مَعَهُمْ مُحَمَّدًا حَتَّى تُنَاجِزُوهُ The only condition in which you should join the fight is if Quraysh and Ghatfan, your supposed partners in this situation, they take some of their notable respectable individuals and they hand them over to you as a security deposit. Like you will hold some of their notables, some of their leaders as a security deposit. So that if the war starts to go south, they don't just turn and they don't just leave. Because then you have their people. They have to stay and defend you and fight with you until you're not free of the situation. So when they heard this, they said, لَقَدْ أَشَرْتَ بِالرَّأِي You make a lot of sense. So he convinced Banu Quraidah. Now, the same man, Nu'aym bin Mas'ud, he goes to Quraysh. And he says to Abu Sufyan and some of the other leaders of Quraysh, قَدْ عَرَفْتُ مُدِّي لَكُمْ وَفِرَاقِ مُحَمَّدًا Y'all know that I'm with y'all. And I don't like Muhammad wasallam. وَإِنَّهُ قَدْ بَلَغَنِي أَمْرٌ قَدْ رَأَيْتُ عَلَيْهِ حَقًّا أَنْ أُبَلِّغُكُمْ أَنْ أُبَلِّغُكُمُهُ he said, and I've heard something, I have some inside information, that I feel it is an obligation upon me to let you know what's going on behind your back. Nushan lakum. I'm looking out for y'all. I have y'all's best interest at heart. Faktumu anni. So please, don't tell anybody that I'm telling you. 
Don't out me as the rat. Right? But I will tell you what's going on. They said, Nafal, absolutely. Don't worry about it. We got you. Tell us, tell us what's going on. So he said, Ta'allamu anna ma'ashara yahud qad nadimu ala ma sana'u fi ma baynahum wa bayna Muhammad. He said, Banu Quraidha are having buyer's remorse. Banu Quraidha is having buyer's remorse. They regret joining you against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They wish they hadn't violated the constitution of Medina and they want to go back. وَقَدْ أَرْسَلُوا إِلَيْهِ أَنَّا قَدْ نَدِمْنَا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْنَا And they've already sent a message to Muhammad وسلم, that we feel bad about what happened. فَهَلْ يُرْضِيكَ أَنَّا خُذَ لَكَ مِنَ الْقَبِيلَتَيْنِ مِنْ قُرَيْشٍ وَغَدْفَانٍ رِجَالًا مِنَ الشَّرَافِيِّمْ فَنُعْطِيَا كَهُمْ فَتَضْرِبَ عَنَاقَهُمْ ثُمَّ نَكُونُ مَعَكَ عَلَى مَنْ بَقِيَ مِنْهُمْ حتى نستعصلهم. So he said, they've sent the word to Muhammad and the Muslims, we feel bad about what happened. Allow us to make it up to y'all. And the way, the, the, the way we suggest making it up to y'all is that what we're going to do is we're going to continue to act like we're still with Quraysh and Ghatfan. We're going to tell them to hand over some of their leaders to us as a security, right, as a guarantee. And once they hand them over to us, we will come and hand those leaders over to you. And then you can execute them. And that'll take the wind out of, uh, from under their wings. That'll suck the air right out of them and their army. And then we will join you in the fight, and then we'll defeat both of them together. This is Banu Quraytha's plan. I'm letting y'all know Quraysh, because I care about y'all. فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنَّ نَعَمْ So communicate to them that, yes, that, that, so when, when they, فَأَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنَّعَمْ So they've agreed to this now. فَإِنْ بَعَثَتْ إِلَيْكُمْ يَهُودٌ يَلْتَمِسُونَ مِنْكُمْ رُوحَنًا مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ فَلَا تَدْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْكُمْ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا So now, they've already agreed to this, right? Banu Quraidha has agreed to this. So now, when Banu Quraidha comes to you, Quraysh, listen, when Banu Quraidha comes to you and says, please, look, it's only fair, we joined you in the fight, so you hand over some of your leaders to us as a security, as a guarantee. Don't you dare hand over even a single person. They're going to stab you in the back. So Quraysh said, okay, okay, we hear you loud and clear. Then he went over to Ghatfan. Now Ghatfan are his people. He said, Ya ma'ashira Ghatfan, innakum asli wa ashirati. He said, oh people of Ghatfan, I'm one of y'all. I'm one of y'all. You're my people. وَأَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّا I love you, I care about you. وَلَا أَرَاكُمْ تَتَّهِمُونَنِي And I trust, I know that y'all trust me. I know that y'all trust me. They said, صَدَقْتْ مَا أَنْتَ عِنْدَنَا بِمُتَّهَمْ They said, of course. We would never doubt you. So he said, okay, فَكْتُمُوا عَنِّي I'm gonna tell you something, but you can't tell anybody that I told you. They said, نَفْعَلْ Absolutely. ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُمْ مِثْلَ مَا قَالَ لِي قُرَيْشِ Then he told them the same thing that he told Quraysh. Look, Banu Quraydha, they, they're doing this, they're doing that, and they're gonna come and ask for some of your people. Don't you hand them over because this is part of their ploy, part of their plan. So, وَحَذَّرَهُمْ مَا حَذَّرَهُمْ So he told them all of this. فَلَمَّا كَانَتْ لَيْلَةُ السَّبْتِ مِنْ شَوَالْ سَنَةَ خَمْسِ so it was Saturday night, the night before Saturday, because they would consider Friday evening like go, the night going into Saturday. So it was sa- that night before Saturday, in the month of Shawwal, in the fifth year of Hijrah, right? The Battle of the Trench. وَكَانَ مِن سُنَعِ اللَّهِ مِن سُنَعِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى لِرَسُولِهِ أَنْ أَرْسَلَ أَبُو سُفْيَانِ وَرُؤُسُ غَطْفَانِ إِلَى بَنِي قُرَيْضَ عِكْرَمَ بِنَا بِالْجَهَلْ فِي نَفْرٍ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ وَغَطْفَانِ And so now Quraysh and Ghatfan, are very, very worried about this situation. So Abu Sufyan sends Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, who is considered one of the leaders of the Quraysh. He sends them with a delegate, he sends him with a delegation to go and talk to Banu Quraydha. So they said to them, and he says to them, Ikrimah says to them, Inna lasna bidari muqam, faqad halak al khufu wal hafir, fa'iddu lil qitali hatta nunajiza Muhammadan. They said, look, we've been camped out outside of Medina. You agreed to join forces with us, but you haven't fought yet. And you are very strategic in this situation because you can 
basically attack from behind and, and you can infiltrate Medina and we haven't called on you yet you've said that you've joined us but you haven't really done anything we've been camped out there for 20 days it's been tough we've had animals starting to die horses are dying the animals that we brought for food and milk and things like that are starting to die it, things are starting to get kind of dicey people are starting to get kind of restless and so y'all need to get ready to fight and launch a, a, an attack infiltrate Medina and launch an attack so that we can settle this issue we can be done with it we want to wrap up things here in Medina and head back home so Banu Quraydar responded by saying inna al yawm sabt today is the Sabbath right according to Jewish tradition and custom they said inna al yawm sabt wa huwa yawmun la la na'mal fihi shay'an it's the Sabbath we're not allowed to really conduct any type of business or activity on this day waqad وَقَدْ كَانَ أَحْدَثَ فِيهِ بَعْضُنَا حَدَثًا فَأَصَابَكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَخْفَى مَا لَمْ يَخْفَى عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَسْنَا مَعَ ذَلِكَ بِالَّذِينَ نُقَاتِلُوا مَعَكُمْ مُحَمَّدًا حَتَّى تُعْتُونَا رُوحَنًا مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ يَكُونُونَ بِيَيْدِينَا ثِقَةً لَنَا حَتَّى نُنَاجِزَ مُحَمَّدًا فَإِنَّا نَخْشَى إِنْ ضَرَّسْتُكُمُ الْحَرْبَ وَاشْتَدَّ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ أَنْ تَنْشَمِرُوا إِلَى بِلَادِكُمْ وَتَتْرُكُونَا وَالرَّجُلُ فِي بِلَادِنَا وَلَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِذَلِكَ مِنْهُ they responded by saying, look, today is the Sabbath, we really can't engage in any type of transaction today, any negotiations today, but we will tell you is one thing, that, you know, we've been thinking about a lot of things, and some things have kind of come to light. And, that, and this is something that you should understand as well. This is not a secret. And that is the fact that we will not agree to join the fight, the actual fight against the Muslims until like we won't infiltrate Medina and actually start killing people until you first hand over you know some of your respectable leaders right some of your key people to be held by us as a security as a guarantee so, so until we're able to defeat Muhammad and his companions because we're afraid that if the tides were to turn if the tides of the battle were to turn, and somehow you started to suffer defeat, that y'all would run away back home and leave us here, and we have to try to live with him and the Muslims, and we wouldn't be able to hold them off. They would overpower us. فَلَمَّا رَجَعَتِ إِلَيْهِمُ الرُّسُلُ بِمَا قَالَتْ بَنُوا قُرِيدَ So Ikrima, in the delegation, they bring this message back to the leadership of Quraysh and Ghatfan. Quraysh and Ghatfan, they said, Wallahi inna alladhi haddathakum Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud al-Haqq. They said, hey look, what Nu'aym bin Mas'ud told you, it's true. Look, that's what, look, just like he said, they're asking for some of our people, because they want to work out this plan. So he said, فَأَرْسَلُوا إِلَى بَنِي قُرَيْذَا إِنَّا وَاللَّهِ لَا نَدْفَعُوا إِلَيْكُمْ رَجُلٌ وَاحِدًا مِنْ رِجَالِنَا فَإِن كُنْتُمْ تُرِيدُونَ الْقِتَالِ فَخْرُجُوا فَقَاتِلُوا And so you go back and you tell them, we swear we will not give you a single person. So if you want to fight, come out and fight. So Banu Quraydah, when the message came back to them, they said, إِنَّ الَّذِي ذَكَرَ لَكُمْ نُعَيْمُ بْنُ مَسُودِ لَحَقِّ So look, what Nu'aym told you is true. They're looking to leave you high and dry. مَا يُرِيدُ الْقَوْمَ أَنْ تُقَاتِلُوا They don't want to fight. فَإِنْ رَأُوا فُرْسَةً إِنْ تَهَزُوهَا That the first chance they get, they're gonna bounce. They're gonna flee. وَإِنْ كَانَ غَيْرُ ذَلِكَ إِنْ شَمَرُوا إِلَى بِلَادِهِمْ وَخَلُّوا بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ فِي بَلَدِكُمْ They're gonna leave you here to deal with Muhammad ﷺ and the Muslims by yourself. So you send them the message back, فَأَرْسَلُوا إِلَى قُرَيْشِ So they sent a message back saying, إِنَّا وَاللَّهِ مَا نُقَاتِلُ مَعَكُمْ حَتَّى تُعْتُونَا رُوحَنًا We're not going to fight until you first hand over some leaders to us. We demand that guarantee. So this kept going back and forth, فَأَبَوْ عَلَيْهِمْ So they kept refusing one another until خَذَّلَ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمْ The ranks started to break and people started to divide amongst them. And then finally the narration says, وَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ الرِّيحَ فِي لَيْلَةٍ شَاتِيَا شَدِيدَةِ الْبَرْدِ That finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night sent such a strong severe wind, فَجَعَلَتْ تَكْفَأُ قُدُورَهُمْ وَتَطْرَحُ أَبْنِيَتَهُمْ that basically the strong wind came to the point where it started to 
um, knock over all their, uh, the, their, their containers that contained all the food and water. All their supplies started spilling and scattering everywhere due to the wind. Their tents started ripping out of the ground and flying away. The pegs that were nailed down to keep their animals tied up came flying out of the ground. And all the animals started running off and scattering off into different directions. And just it completely obliterated their camp and their army. Now to further describe exactly what happened in this situation, the, the scholars of the Sirah also mention that at this particular time, and there's multiple different narrations from Ibn Ishaq, and there's also a narration that's found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, that the Prophet ﷺ at this particular time, he asked, so Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who narrates the incident, he says that the situation had gotten so severe that um, that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, that the situation had gotten so severe that the Sahaba were now so physically overwhelmed due to hunger and weakness and the cold that they were literally like withering away. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he called and he said that I need somebody who will go and, you know, take care of something for me. And he called out a couple of times, and there wasn't anyone that was particularly there. Actually, I'll mention this. Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he act, when he narrates the incident, he says that some of the students of Hudayfa, some of the tabi'un, Ibrahim ibn Yazim the taymi and others, they narrate, kunna inda Hudayfa. We were sitting with Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Kufa in Iraq, much, much later. And he says, while we were sitting with him, a man said to him, لَوْ أَدْرَكْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, قَاتَلْتُ مَعَهُ وَأَبْلَيْتُ That if I would have been with the Prophet وسلم, I would have fought by his side, and I would have served the Prophet وسلم. Another uh, few people also started to say, that if we were with the Prophet wasallam, we would have done this and this and this. Some people started to say, we would never even let his feet touch the ground. We would carry him everywhere where he went. You know, and this is natural, right? Even when we think of the Prophet wasallam, that if we were to ever physically be in the company of the Prophet we do we would just sit at his feet. Right? We would just sit at his feet. We would be at his beck and call. We would just, you know, hang on every single word. And so they were talking like this. And Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, not doubting their love for the Prophet wasallam, But at the same time, Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu knows, much like how we would be, um, you know, saying things like that. He said, Kunta taf'al dhalik? Really? Is that what you would do? Oh, really? Tell me what else you would do. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Right? And then finally he told them, لا تتمن, لا تتمن Don't wish to be there in that situation. Because y'all don't know if y'all would be able to handle what that situation was like. And then he tells the incident, he says that the Prophet ﷺ was saying, I need somebody to go and take care of a task. And the Prophet ﷺ was looking around until he finally saw me. And the Prophet ﷺ, in one narration, he even says that the Prophet ﷺ called on me. And he said, Ala ya'tini rajulun bi khabri al qawmi yakunu ma'ayya yawm al qiyamah. Is there anyone who will go infiltrate the opposing army, sneak in behind their ranks, find out what's going there, bring me back the news, and that person will be with me on the day of resurrection? Falam yujibhu minna ahadun. He says that nobody answered. ثُمَّ الثَّانِيَ ثُمَّ الثَّالِثَ مِثْرَ Within the second time and the third time, the Prophet ﷺ called out. Finally, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, يَا حُذَيْفَ يَا حُذَيْفَ Right? In another narration, he says that he called me, يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ Like he called me by his kunia. And he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he says at that time, فَلَمْ أَجِدْ بُدًّا I was so weak, and I was so shaking and you know, shivering from the cold. I only had one sheet, one shawl to cover me. And that too, I had borrowed my wife's shawl because it was a little bit thicker. I gave my thin little sheet to my wife because she was inside the home. And I took her thick sh shawl and wrapped it around myself that went from my chest to my knees to keep me a little bit more warm. And I was basically curled up in a ball. I was in the fetal position he describes. 
I was in the fetal position and I was sticking to the ground. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Hudayfa. And I didn't even have enough energy. I hadn't eaten. I was shaking and shivering from the cold. I couldn't even get my voice out to respond to him. And he said, Qum. Fa'tina bi khabri al He said, Stand up. Go find out what the people are doing. And he said that I barely had any type of energy to be able to like even physically get up from the ground. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ came up to me. And in one narration, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he kind of nudged me with his foot. And he said, come on, let's go. And he says that the moment the Prophet ﷺ kind of nudged me, I felt a little bit of energy and I stood up. And then I said to the Prophet ﷺ, that please make dua for me. Make dua for me. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أسألوا أن يكون رفيقي في الجنة. That I ask Allah to make you my companion in paradise. And he said, the moment the Prophet ﷺ said that, all of my fear, all of my weakness, everything was gone. It's like I received a shot of adrenaline. I, was, I jumped up from the ground. And he describes in the narration of Sahih Muslim, this is very fascinating, he says that, وَأَمْشِي فَمَضَيْتُهُ كَأَنَّمَا أَمْشِي فِي حَمَّامٍ I felt like I was walking in a, like, uh, like in, in a hot bath. Like I felt, all of a sudden my body was so warm, I felt like I was soaking in a hot bath. Like I was surrounded by hot steam. I felt warm. Forget about not feeling cold, I felt warm. I was comfortable, I was loose. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave me some instruction. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تحدث شيئا حتى تأتيني He said, اذهب فأتني بخبر القوم Go and find out what's going on in the army. And do not do anything. Don't do anything. Don't make any judgment call on your own part. Come back and tell me what's going on. And in another narration, he also went on to mention that he specifically told him, لا تذعرهم عليا. لا تذعرهم عليا. Do not do something that will cause them to launch an offensive or an attack. Don't do anything rash. So I said, okay. So I went, I snuck across the trench. I got into the enemy ranks. I went there until I saw some of the people gathered up. There was a fire that was burning. And I saw a man. He was kind of heating his back with the fire. He had turned his back on the fire and he was trying to warm his back up. And he says that Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu was from Medina. So he said, I had never seen Abu Sufyan before. But then I saw that everyone was gathered up around him. So I recognized that this seems to be the leader of the people. And he was talking to the people, asking them what we should do, what we should do. Banu Quraidah has abandoned us. The ranks of our army are breaking. And things are starting to look really, really bad. So what do we do? And he said that finally, he started to tell the people, and he said while he was talking, he started to tell the people, some people started saying, we should leave, we should leave. We should go, we should go. And he said, okay, fine, go. And people started to kind of like separate from there, go in, and the wind was starting to blow even harder. Animals were starting to scatter. The, you know, like I said before, the containers of food started to spill over. And people started rushing, grabbing their stuff, getting their animals, and started dispersing. The army before my very eyes started to break apart. And at that moment, as the crowd started to part, I saw Abu Sufyan right in front of me. And so I had my bow and arrow with me. It was a situation of war, everyone's carrying weapons, so it wasn't suspicious. And I reached back, I took an arrow out, and I placed it inside of my bow, and I aimed it right at Abu Sufyan. It was dark, it was night. And I had a clear shot at him. And I said, this is the guy who's in charge. If I take this guy out, we're done, we're in the clear. And he said, I was right about to, I was taking my aim, and I heard the words of the Prophet ﷺ echoing in my head. لا تحدث عني شيئاً Don't do anything from yourself. Don't make the situation worse. Do exactly what I told you to do. 
One of the profound lessons our teacher used to highlight for us in this particular incident is that our deen, there's a powerful lesson here. Our deen is not only about doing what we've been told to do, but also doing it how we've been told to do. It's not just the what, it's also the how. And not only that, but we've also been taught where to draw the line. And so it's knowing what to do, but also knowing what not to do. It's knowing what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to go about and doing it. This is ita'a, this is ittiba'a, this is obedience in following the Prophet And in that moment, think about it. He's looking at the head of the snake, and he's saying, I can take him out, and maybe solve this entire situation, but it's putting that type of faith and trust in Allah and His Messenger And knowing that what they've said is better, and what they've recommended is safer. And having that type of faith and trust. And he said, immediately as I heard the voice of the Prophet ﷺ echoing in my head, I removed my arrow from the bow, and I put it back into my quiver, and I started to come back. And he says that when I came back to the Prophet ﷺ, I had also forgotten to mention that he also says the Prophet ﷺ also made dua for him, Allahumma hafadhu min bayni yadayhi. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ وَعَنْ يَمِينِهِ وَعَنْ شِمَالِهِ وَمِنْ فَوْقِهِ وَمِنْ تَحْتِهِ O oh Allah, protect him from in front of him, from behind him, from the right of him, from the left of him, from on top of him and from below him. So he says that, I finally came back to the Prophet some safe and sound, because the Prophet ﷺ had made dua for me. And as I was leaving, this, he says people were screaming to one another in the army, of the enemy, they were screaming, يَا آلَ عَامِرْ الرَّحِيلَ الرَّحِيلَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ Right? Ar-Rahil, Ar-Rahil. Everywhere I heard people saying, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. We can't stay here any longer. And before my very eyes, the army was departing and the winds were so severe, so harsh. It was like blowing people away. It was knocking people over. And he says the most amazing thing was, the second, the second that I stepped out of the enemy camp, the wind was so still that it wouldn't move a hair on my head. Outside of the enemy camp, not a hair would move. And the second you stepped inside the enemy camp, it would blow a human being away. Right? That that was the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that miraculously came. So he said, I was still feeling like the heat and the energy. I couldn't feel anything of the cold. I was there in the middle of their camp and I did, still didn't feel cold even with that severe wind. And I came back to the Prophet ﷺ, and as soon as I came back to the Prophet ﷺ, and I sat down and the task was over, it's like all the cold came rushing back to me. And he said, I started to shake and shiver. I was shaking so severely, right? And that I couldn't even control my body. And he says, the Prophet ﷺ was standing and praying. And he had a shawl on him, and a little bit of his shawl was kind of like hanging down. And while he was standing and I was starting to shake and shiver so badly, like almost violently, because the cold just came rushing back to me. Can you imagine freezing temperatures outside and you go out with like, like, like an undershirt on or something like that? And the cold just hits you and you start to shake and shiver, you can't even control your body. It was almost like violent. Right? So I started experiencing that. And the Prophet was standing and praying and his shawl was hanging. The Prophet with his hand, he gestured towards me. He just kind of gestured me at his hand. And I went close, I sat close to the Prophet ﷺ to the point where I pressed myself up against the leg of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ dropped his shawl like he was standing, he kind of just dropped his shawl and his shawl covered me. And I sta laid there hugging the leg of the Prophet ﷺ while he prayed. And immediately the cold was gone from me. I, could, I, I was comforted by the touch of the Prophet ﷺ. And he says that after the Prophet ﷺ was done praying, then I told him exactly what I had seen and what was going on and what was transpiring. Uh, oh, so excuse me. He says that I came and I laid down and I cling to the Prophet ﷺ until he finished praying. And when he finished praying, I told him what I had seen and that the whole army is dispersed and the help from Allah came and this terrible wind just came and just obliterated their camp and destroyed their army and they're all packing their bags and most of them left. I saw most of them leaving. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Alhamdulillah, that's the help from Allah. 
And then the Prophet ﷺ, it was night time, so it was his qiyam time. So the Prophet ﷺ continued to sit there and continued to pray. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell me to move. So I said, I'm not going to move. So he said that I continued to lay there next to touching the leg of the Prophet ﷺ with his shawl kind of like covering me. And I fell asleep. And I kept on sleeping. I just slept there for the whatever time was left of the night. An hour or two that was left in the night. I just laid there sleeping in, curled up in a ball next to the Prophet ﷺ, covered by his shawl until it was time for Fajr. <laughs> and he says that, فَلَمَّا أَنْ أَصْبَحْتُ Finally when it was Fajr time, and the adhan was called, and it was time to go pray, the Prophet ﷺ kind of nudged me and he said, قُمْ يَا نَوْمَان He said, wake up sleepy head. Wake up, wake up sleepy head. Enough, that's enough sleep. Let's go, let's go pray Fajr. And he said, then I went and I prayed Fajr with the Prophet ﷺ. And that's how the battle of the trench was concluded. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we're going to go through Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, properly, and you'll see all these events unfolding. But Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, udhkuru ni'amat Allahi alaykum. That recall, remember, remind yourself, recollect, remind one another of the blessings of Allah upon you. إِذْ جَاءَتْكُمْ جُنُودٌ When the armies all gathered together and came, among, came against you, فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا but we unleashed the wind upon them. وَجُنُودَ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And we released an army upon them that you can't even see. The invisible wind. We unleashed the army of the invisible wind upon them. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا Allah was watching over you the entire time. Allah had your back. And Allah was watching over you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, وَكَفَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الْقِتَالِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so that the believers did not have to end up fighting them. And so much so that Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in another uh, narration as well about this particular incident, he says that as I was even, as I was crossing over the trench, when I was, you know, spying on the enemy army, and as I was ca- uh, going back through the trench, crossing over the trench, one of the soldiers of the enemy army saw me. And he saw me going through the trench, and the Muslims allowing me to come over, they, he recognized I was one of them, and he said, أَخْبِرْ صَاحِبَكَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ كَفَاهُ You go and you tell your, your guy, Muhammad wasallam, that God was on his side. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved you of the need to have to fight us. And then the Prophet ﷺ, as the enemy was dispersing in front of the eyes of the Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, Imam Ahmad rahimullah ta'ala narrates this, that the Prophet ﷺ gathered the Muslims together and he said, Al-an nakhzuhum wa la yakhzuna. Al-an nakhzuhum wa la yakhzuna. That now, the next time we see these people, they will not come and attack us, but we will march into their city. The next time we see them, they will not be marching to Medina. We'll be marching to Mecca the next time we see them. And the Prophet ﷺ told the Muslims that. And then I'll finally conclude here because we're talking about the conclusion of the battle. Ibn Ishaq and other scholars of the seerah like Ibn Hisham and others, they relate six Muslims died in the battle of the trench. There were six shuhada, six martyrs in the battle of the trench. Three of them were from Banu Abdul Ashhal. Um, they were Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who we will talk about in, a few, uh, in the coming sessions. Number two was Anas ibn Aus. The third was Abdullah bin Sahal. And then these three were from Banu Abdul Ashal. And then the other individuals were Tufail bin al Nu'man, Tha'laba uh, ibn Ghanama, and Ka'ab bin Zayd uh, al Najari. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum, ajma'een. That they were basically killed because of, you know, when they were launching arrows constantly, that because of stray arrows, these six sahaba ended up dying. So these were the six shuhada of Khandaq. And similarly, from the mushrikun, only three people died. From the enemy army, only three people died. And they were Munabbah ibn Uthman, who also was killed by a stray arrow that the Muslims launched back over. He was actually injured, but he died. He went, made the journey back, but then he died back in Mecca. The second was uh, Nawfal bin Abdullah. He was somebody who, again, very misguidedly, very mistakenly, he tried to go through the trench, and then he got caught inside the trench, and he was killed there. And, we ta- and then the third individual was Amr bin Abdiwud who we talked about was kind of like their warrior, uh, like, a, like a war hero from the Quraysh. 
and he actually made it over the trench. He made it through the trench. He was able to get his horse to jump over, but then Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu finished him off. And these last two, one who was killed inside the trench and one who made it over, and then Ali radiallahu anhu finished him. The mushrikun of Mecca, they wanted their bodies back, if you recall, and they said that we will pay you to hand their bodies over, and the Prophet ﷺ said, no. That goes against our values and our ethics. We don't charge people money. We don't bribe people to get the bodies of their dead. Give them the bodies of their deceased. And the bodies were delivered. So now you see also part of the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. And for anybody, for a lot of the unfortunate, you know, in uh, misinformed and incorrect uh, analysis that goes on about Islam and the history of Islam, particularly the life of the Prophet ﷺ, where they would dare to make these false accusations about the Prophet ﷺ or the Muslims being bloodthirsty and killing people and massacring people. The Prophet ﷺ put his own people through such difficulty and duress and hardship that for three weeks, they were hungry and thirsty, withering away, shriveling, sh shriveling away in the cold. And he would endure all of that to avoid the massive loss of life. To the point where only nine people died in this incident. Such a huge incident. And only nine people died, only three of the enemy died. That that was the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. That the Prophet ﷺ was all about the preservation of life. That was his goal and objective. That if they are Muslims, how we can preserve their lives? Of course. And even if they're non-Muslims, how we, can we still preserve their lives and show them the lights and bring them to Islam so that they can be successful not only in this life, but in the eternal life of the hereafter. That was the goal and the objective of the Prophet ﷺ. How can we take all of humanity, all of mankind to paradise? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to live our lives in accordance with the prophetic legacy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the insight of the beautiful life of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live and conduct ourselves in accordance with the Quran, principles of the Book of Allah, the Qur'an, and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to practice everything that we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashad wa la ilaha illa anta, nasakhfirak wa natubu ilayk. I know that we're kind of like covering the end of the incident. If anybody uh, would like like to study the beginning of the incident and maybe isn't familiar with everything that happened. Alhamdulillah, every week we conduct the session here. And so um, what you're able to do, we record it for the benefit of the, you know, the general community, brothers and sisters everywhere. So if you go to Qalam's website, qalaminstitute.org, um, you can there listen to the podcast, download the previous sessions, and inshallah benefit you and your family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.